So I'm, I think it's probably a good time to start, if that's okay. Um, if I introduce myself, my name is Mike Berlin, and welcome all of you. It's lovely to see you. And what I propose that we do is we're going to spend approximately an hour or so having a, a conversation, a discussion, an investigation of uh, what I think are important aspects of British culture. Um, and your, what, what I'm really interested in doing is getting you to think, to, to talk about what you think is important about British culture. I teach history, so a lot of the things that I will be talking about are very historical. And, but I want to try to relate the history to the present. And I'm going to do that using his, some, some evidence. And the first thing I'm going to hand around is, we don't have to look at it in detail right now, but I think you might well, I'll, I'll refer to it as we go along, and I hope you'll find it interesting, if not amusing, because it, it's, it's um, a document that was produced before the outbreak of the uh, war, the Second World War, and it's uh, a comical document which was produced by someone who is a, a political refugee to Britain, and it's called How to Be an Alien, which is, uh, and he gives this man named George Mikesh, came from Hungary uh, in 1938. Eight. So it's quite old-fashioned. It's possibly mostly out of date, but it's still quite funny in some ways. And there are aspects of what he's got to say um, that are uh, an insight into, I think, what British culture is meant to be about. Thank you. Uh, just sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think what you have to first understand is I'm not from Britain either, uh, you know, this is m my adoptive home, so in a sense I, I'm from, uh, originally from North America, but the point is that people from outside a culture who are visitors often have things to say about the culture that they're in that nobody else would um, have that v point of view. They have a unique insight, so you have a unique insight into what Britain's about, even though you're not from Britain. And, it, and you will have observations that, in a sense, will tell you, tell, tell the rest of the world a lot more about what Britain is like than uh, might otherwise be the case. Um, the thing I'd like to start by doing is, to getting, is, is by getting you to um, generalize about what you think Britain is about. So what I normally ask people to do in this circumstance is if you've got a piece of paper or a notebook could you, you could use that at the back of that if you like, is could you get that piece of paper in a notebook out now? And it can just be the back of the, the handout if you want to, you don't worry about that. Um, and draw a line down the middle. So you draw a line down the middle and then two lines through the middle line. So you have three, three sections. So two lines. So you have, it creates a kind of bar across the middle. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Does that make sense? Here, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, that's perfect. Like that. And, and then, sorry, just to keep it from you. So, and then here, think of this section as being, this section as being about, let's say, politics and, and government and constitution. And this, this section can be about uh, economy and society. And maybe this section can be about culture and language, religion, whatever you want it to be. So you can have these three sections. And then think about this section. So you have these one, two, three. And this section is where you come from. This is your country. This is England or Great Britain. And if you could say what is similar and what is different in each section. 
Just try doing that for just like about five, ten minutes and see what you come up with. And do you know the word stereotype? Yeah, okay. So don't be afraid of putting down a stereotype. It, that is, inserting a stereotype. If, if you say, you know, um, English food is bad, that's a stereo, you know, very old stereotype. Or um, uh, British people are, uh, upper class British people are unfriendly and cold and you know, negative, that standoffish, that's a stereotype. Don't be afraid of the stereotype in the first instance. Hello. Politics, economy, society, culture. There you go. I think there might be two there. And just note down one or two things. It doesn't have to be a lot. It can be a lot or a little. Particularly interested in things like forms of government or how the economy works or maybe how society is structured, um, what's the religious makeup of the society, that sort of thing, just generalizations. Do that for about five minutes and then we'll see how far we get. And some, some of you may say, well, I'm from Canada and Canada was, used to be a British colony and so there's lots of similarities. Other people might say, I'm from a Mexico and Mexico and Britain have not very little in common. So it's, it's up to you how much you want to say. It might be something very basic that you're saying, like I know what a lot of people from America say, that the coins are very heavy in the pockets and they make kind of holes in your pockets. Or the food is small on the plate. Or the, you know, that sort of thing is, is equally interesting and important. And if you can't think of something and there's, and you don't, or there's you know, no similarities, no differences, and you just leave it blank, it doesn't matter if it's not, it doesn't have to be filled out. And I'm not going to collect these. These are for you, really. Okay. I think that's it. I think we can probably sort of pull, stop now and, and, and come back together and pool our, our findings as a group. And what I'm, I guess what I'm interested in is when we go through each category, whether or not there are similarities about what you stay, say, particularly about Britain's, what you think about Britain, really. It's, it's, uh, um, and then I'll tell you what I think about e the differences and similarities are might be. What's unique about Britain? What's b distinctive about politics and culture, economy, society, the different categories that we've laid it out. So see if, see if this gels with anything that you've come up with. So let's start with politics and constitution and uh, economy. Sorry, politics and the constitution and um, uh, forms of government. What, what, what sort of things did you come up with? You go around the room. Sorry, I'm putting, okay. I'm putting on. I'm not quite sure what is the correct terminology, considering that we both share this, first class system. Yeah, so that's a form of election whereby the, uh, in each area, like a uh, part of London, when they have an election, the person who wins the election is based on the person who gains the most number of votes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a similarity. Yeah. How about a difference? Um, well, I happen to think Britain exercises a new kind of strategies that are very subtle but very effective, okay. whereas my own country does not. Okay, that's fair it's enough. It's too small. That's fair enough. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's an absolutely fine. That, and, and we'll, in a sense, come back to that, I think. How about you? Yeah. I'm not that much into politics, but, <laughs> well, I come from France. I was born in France. Yeah. I know that in the UK, you have still, you know, Queen Elizabeth. Right. In France, the president. Yeah. And the equivalent is, if I'm not wrong, the prime minister of UK. Yes, yeah. So you have this very different constitutional structure. It's uh, with, in France, you have an, uh, an elected head of state. Here you have a hereditary monarch. And that's the, the difference you're pointing out. Yeah. And the, the head of state is different in England from the person who is actually the chief executive, which is the prime minister. 
Don't, if you say, I haven't got anything to say, that's fine. Okay. Uh, in terms of politics, I think, the, I mean, I come from Burundi, uh -huh. and I see some, uh, I was more finding differences. I didn't have time to find some right but I think they are different, because it seems to me that here in the UK you have kind of a parliamentary, uh, parliamentary government, mm -hmm. while in, in my country we have, I, I would say, a presidential rabbi is the president who is the executive officer of, of the whole. And another thing is that here it seems you have only two political parties, and my country have many So you've got two things coming out of that. You've got the concept in constitutional terms uh, of the idea of a, is a parliamentary democracy. So the government is formed on the basis of the majority party in the legislature, the House of Commons, that, and the person who leads the majority party is the prime minister. Yeah. And then the other point is that you've got um, multi, the concept of multi-party democracy um, in Britain, there are smaller parties, but the two the two party system dominates conservative and labor. But there is also a liberal party, a green party, Scottish nationalist party, Irish different parties in in Northern Ireland. So you're right and you're wrong at the same time, which is often the case. I think human beings are often right and wrong at the same time. Uh, hello everyone. Well, um, I'm from Russia. So, oh well, first of all, there are actually very different uh, political structures, of course, in Great Britain and in Russia. Uh, because in Russia it's a president republic, and uh, in, in, in the UK, and the UK is monarchy. Uh, we also have different legislation, different legal system, because uh, Russia has continental legal system and the uh, UK's classical Anglo-Saxon legal system and English law. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also constitution, but there is no well, constitution in the UK. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a yeah. constitution, but it's not good. Like, good. Uh, Very, good. Very good. And uh, we also have well different court system but um, uh, as we are, we are talking about legislation, um, Russian legislation system um, tried to implement some English law concepts and actually many uh, Russian companies and major Russian companies sometimes well, very often structure their deals and their transactions under English law because um, this more um, stable concepts in English law, well, concepts related to protection, private property, and related to uh, corporate structure of you know, companies. So that's 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 a pretty good detailed point, and the the um, the key. Key, there's, there's something a bit that we'll come back to about constitution, but the key issue is that there's a uh, the a concept of Anglo-Saxon common law, as it's known, which is the the basic body of law by which uh, the British court system operates. Slightly different in Scotland, they have a sort of different, slightly different system. But if you know, if anyone knows the way the law operates in other parts of Europe. One of the things that distinguishes English common law is that um, there's an adversarial system in the courtroom. Uh, the, that is to say, both sides are battling with one another to the prosecution and the defense to prove a case before either a judge or a jury. And the question is not at arriving as is often the case, say, for example, in French uh, criminal law, arriving at an abstract concept of what happened, and, and that's sometimes referred to in England as the inquisitorial system, where you have a, 
an examining magistrate whose role it is to question people, but it's the idea that you have a kind of battle in the courtroom. It's a verbal battle, it's a legal battle, but very good. What sort of things? So, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Grace, I'm from Taiwan. Yeah. And um, I think that our, uh, concerning the political, the government mm -hmm. things, and compared to the British stuff, it's like, I think it's like a bit like in the extreme polls mm -hmm. that um, we are um, in Taiwan. We are based. We are actually deeply rely on the state. So um, our government systems and constitution, the state is like uh, we follow the we establish it. It's almost like the same uh, as the states, like uh, their legislation, the way of they construct. And um, but we also have two dominant parties. Mm -hmm. So it's like you either go for A or you go for B. But most of the time, both of them sucks. <laughs> but you still, but That's a in, common opinion here. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah but so, uh, people always say like, oh, both of them sucks, but they will still go for, they will still vote for one because they are like the two dominant ones. And that is pretty much it's similar. So mo it's, it's a one two party system yeah. essentially. Yeah, but there are also some small parties. Yeah. But like that too is like the dominant one. So it's always like sweeping between these two parties. And um, what else? I don't really know much about the political thing. But yeah. Probably, yes, if it comes to Britain, probably Brexit. Like everyone's. Discussing this thing now. Yes, it's becoming and a national obsession. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, in Britain, like you have to follow the English common law, and the EU's, uh, they have their also their regulation stuff, right? So that you have to follow like two different um, regulations, or well, I mean, British law. Uh, kind of getting into the detail, British law is the subject. Is is is. Um, the result of uh, a, a basic system of English common law, which is the result of a, an accumulation of judgments. Uh, some legislation, like this year we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of women, or some women, getting the right to vote, and that was an act of parliament, the Representation of the People Act 1918, just after the First World War. It didn't give all women the right to vote, only women above the age of 30. So. Uh, I think pretty much everyone here would, except for me, would you know would, would, you wouldn't qualify. But that that so it's that acts of parliament. But also there's European law, which is incorporated in British law, and then some international law, which is also incorporated in British law. And that is part of the Brexit discussion: is what's going to happen to those different pieces of European legislation, which have been incorporated into British law. Once Britain leaves the European Union, the question is, will British governments repeal the laws that were incorporated into British law? And some of those laws are good, so you know, people will, there'll be a battle or a, com a conflict over that. Uh, so I'm Ben, I'm from Australia, um, well, which yeah. was, I guess, originally a British colony, so I'm sort of seeing a lot that um, looks very similar, mm -hmm. um, but, but also a few differences. I, I think in terms of um, like the smaller parties, it's probably not that they make up that many in number, but they probably get more of a look in in Australia mm -hmm. because of the, um, the voting method, the first class, the post, I think here seems to um, preclude, preclude them a little bit. Um, they have their hereditary positions in the House of Lords, um, which we don't have in Australia, so everyone is I mean, elected, I guess, on merit and a popular vote. Um, I think the other sort of difference I'm seeing is sort of division of responsibility between sort of states and the, um, uh, the federal government. In Australia, we actually have, they have, fed, we have state governments, yeah. which kind of seem to form a similar role as the councils, possibly. I'm not sure, but... Um, Good. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I'm going to jump, I'm going to show you some images because I think it's, it's worthwhile because some of the points you're raising about, about constitution, about structures are so, are, are quite technically detailed, so it might be useful. The, the, um, there is a body called the, there, like many countries, Britain has two, its legislature is divided into two, bicameral is the technical word for this, an upper house and a lower house. 
and the lower house, the House of Commons, is the more powerful of the two houses. The upper house, the House of Lords, was for many, many centuries the more powerful house, but it, and it represents, uh, it traditionally represented a hereditary ruling elite. You know what I mean by that, in the sense of people who, who had inherited power through their families, and these people are, were the landlords. For example, we're in Bloomsbury, the, the whole of the land of Bloomsbury from the Euston Road all the way down to Holborn is owned by one family. You'll remember on our walk I talked about that, the Dukes of Bedford. They would sit in the House of Lords traditionally and they wear these red robes and so on. But since the early part of the century, the hereditary vote has been uh, systematically, uh, if you like, uh, eradicated. And now the upper house is more or less appointed by the government of the day. Some of those appointees are people who had previously been hereditary, but they are appointed by the government of the day. And it doesn't make it any better. I'm not saying it's better, because, and, there are, it's, but it, and it's not elected. And the, the upper house is a revising chamber. That is to say, it is a place where legislation goes to, to be revised, but it has no powers to veto legislation. Um, I just look at a constitution. Now, most countries have written documents that are like the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution of 1783 in the United States, or what happened in France in 1789, or Japan has a constitution. Britain doesn't have a written constitution, is the distinction. It does have various documents which are constitutional documents. Uh, but no one document. So it's, you have court judgments you know, about whether or not someone can be uh, tried twice. You have documents, very famous ones, like you may have heard of. The famous, you can go and see it in the British Library up the road, the Magna Carta, which is probably the most everyone's heard of, if you may have heard of. Uh, the Great Charter, as it's called. It's a Latin word, and that was from the medieval period, from 1215. Um, and then they're more running up to the modern era, they're more modern acts of parliament, like the Representation of the People Act, but there's no one act. And that's what makes Britain sort of weird, in a way, strange, is that it's as a parliamentary democracy with lots of flaws, neo-colonialist flaws and other flaws, it, never, it, as it functions as a modern state government system with a, a form of constitution which is a, a bit of a, you know what, the, a patchwork, uh, a kind of um, almost a, a rickety structure, some of which is a borrowing from the past, some of which is entirely modern. And it's very strange, but somehow it functions successfully. It's a unitary nation state, and some countries are not unitary, some are federations or confederation, so the United States is a federation of states with different laws in different parts of the country. In Britain, mostly, the law is the same throughout England, although Scotland, because it's become more independent, has different laws. So it's a, it's a strange place. Should we, do you, what I've said about politics, does it, are there any observations that this, you, you guys want to throw in, or should we move on to other areas? Differences, similarities? No? I don't really want to start things on that, but I mean, uh, from what I understood, um, there's like a conservative predominance um, in the history of alternation of government. Um, well, um, the, the, in terms of the domination of political parties yes. in, in government, the, the main party in, in government, yeah. uh, since you have to go back a hundred years, let's go back to say 1850, mm -hmm. you're right, has been the Conservative Party. Um, and it, certainly in the 20th century, there are, for most of the 20th century, the Conservative Party has been the government of the day. Um, and there, there are complicated reasons for that. But then there was also, because the 20th, early 20th century saw the decline of a old, what is now the old party, the Liberal Party, 
which we had been a very important party in the 19th century, split into two and, and fell apart, and that gave conservatives dominance in the, in the 20th century as labor rose to power. It's a kind of weird thing, which most people in this country uh, who are not familiar with find the strangest thing about Britain, which is the monarch. Um, Man, many countries have monarchies, uh, and so uh, you may already have an, an awareness of what a monarchy is. But um, what's important about the monarchy is that monarch is um, theoretically has no political authority. In, in, that is, that, that, that monarch is merely a symbolic head of state and that the real power exists in the House of Commons with the Prime Minister. However, coming from Australia, this might be, if you know Australian history, this might be pertinent. You may know that there is still, in this country, the monarch is very popular, as, you know, she's well liked and so on. It's not a question of popularity, but that as head of state, political, um, people with power Policemen, judges, uh, military officials, soldiers swear allegiance to the queen. They don't swear allegiance to parliamentary democracy or the, consti the unwritten constitution or the House of Commons. They swear allegiance to the queen. And it's not so much that the queen individually has power, it's the whole concept of the crown, the authority of the crown because many things can be uh, in, in, in law, uh, traditionally, the, the state, that is the crown, can do things and be legally immune. For example, in the past 25 years there, and 30 years, there have been a series of cases of young people going into the military and in training, as they're training to be soldiers, dying in accidents or because of bad things happening, you know, being, being beaten up. And those cases, the families try to take the government to, the, to court and fail because the concept is of the crown having ultimate authority cannot sue itself. Does that make sense? It can't charge itself. So that's one flaw in the English Constitution. So civil servants, uh, the monarchy is uh, the, the source of authority. Is that a good thing or a bad thing, do you think? It depends. I mean, you say they don't have any political force, right? Yeah. But at the same time, like, all the power is, like, for to, to... So let's say, for example, just example, uh, the Prime Minister and his upper house is, went into against, like, or, like, disagreement with the monarchy. Who would have the upper, like the power here? Like, would police, soldiers, and everyone like support the monarchy, or would they support? I'm not. I'm just hypothetical. No, it, it's it is the ultimate question. Mm -hmm. it, it it's 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 the the most pertinent question. So, for example, you could have there might be a general election while you're here. There could you know likely to be an election while you're here, and it might be that uh, the Labour Party is elected, and the Labour Party might take, because it's led by Jeremy Corbyn, might take positions in relation to the British Crown, the British state, which people might object to uh, in the government, uh, in the permanent state. So, for example, uh, the best example might be nuclear weapons, let's say, for sake of argument. So Britain has a nuclear weapons. It has a polar a submarines cruising around the world with uh, nuclear weapons ready to fire, etc. And the, um, if there was an emergency, and the Labour Party propo is proposing, theoretically, to get rid of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, the heads of the military really want to retain military, those nuclear weapons for reasons that they would justify on strategic military grounds and so on. That could bring a constitutional crisis. So, uh, but it, it's never happened before, so we don't know. You know, it, and, and, and it's a very good question. Um, 
another question is sometimes asked, which some, the, the queen personally is very popular as a figure. She's been a monarch for, since 1951, 52, and she's um, the longest reigning monarch and, and very committed to her job and very kind of uh, popular figure in a, in, a, in, a, in a slightly distant way because she's very elderly now. And indeed, there are very few people, the minority of the British population have lived what, before she was queen. So most everyone in Britain who's lived in Britain was living during her, 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 her reign. But there are some people who would argue that it's very uh, antiquated, uh, backward, if you like, to have the head of state is not elected. It, it would, it, that somehow to have this idea of a hereditary monarch is, is backward. What do you think? Does it bother you? Is it, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? From where I come from, um, like, but for us, like, it's a royal uh, system, so basically it is inherited. Uh, mm -hmm. But they have more power, like they have all the political power. And I see it a good thing because somehow, because it is inherited, they feel that they are um, committed to serve this land, mm -hmm. and that feeling is coming from, like, inheritance. So it's like protecting your own family, it's like protecting your own house, trying to improve it as much as possible. That mm -hmm. gives you like more, um, let's say, potential or like desire to make it the best. Unlike with other systems where people like, maybe it's a democracy and people have been elected, maybe or maybe not, um, they have whatever like hidden desires, but it, I mean like I cannot we cannot be judgmental and say it's the case everywhere, but I mean, like, it is positive from that perspective. Um, that's how I see it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the arguments that you've put forward are the sort of arguments that people who are in favor of a hereditary mo monarchy put forward in Britain to a certain extent. They would say, uh, supporters of the hereditary monarchy would say that having a hereditary monarch removes the head of state from day to day politics, mm -hmm. left, right, you know, the politicians, the kind of debates between parties, and provides a kind of apolitical figure which, uh, who, who in a sense depoliticizes the issue. Um, the, the, there's another set of arguments around having an elected head of state which say that um, if you had an elected head of state you might have, depending on whether or not what your politics are, people say well, you might have a president Tony Blair or President Margaret Thatcher. You know, it, people argue that way in different ways. Um, there are other models. If you know Ireland, for example, Ireland has a head of a president. Germany has a president, and that president is very much like the monarch. They have uh, no real. They have only kind of symbolic constitutional power. They don't have the real executive day-to-day -day authority. So you, you, know, you have a. Uh, a in Ireland, you have a, the president of Ireland, but you also have the prime minister, the Taoiseach, who is the person who, who works on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's a different model. Shall we go on to a different area and talk about a different area, talk about, uh, sorry. It's, it's also very important for people to have some symbol of the power, because maybe it, it makes them, makes the nation more, uh, I don't know, maybe cohesive. cohesive. Yes. Yeah, that's. I mean, that, that all nations have symbols, don't they? All nations have. Uh, um, uh, they have constitutions. They have flags. They have um, uh, football teams. They have things that bring them together that make them think about their country. And I guess the question is, do you want to have a system where you have a head of state? Who is the symbol? The you know the 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 symbol of all that your nation is, whatever, however it's constituted, is also this person who is the most powerful person. That's the question, I think. Should we go on to talk about society, uh, the economy, and and uh, and and uh, what did you say when you said economy? Sorry, I'm going to. You're going to have, um, have to carry the can. I just said that um, Britain positions itself as first world, but in fact it's more second world. And so we have a second world versus third world situation between Britain and my home country. Uh, 
don't know much about the British economy outside from where a lot of the wealth came from back in the prior to 19th century. So I put that on the culture. Okay. So Britain is a, is a, a country whose wealth is based around colonialism yeah. then and neo-colonialism now. I guess the question that I'm trying to kind of point to is, or get at, is, is there anything, say, different in Britain that might be, I'm going to use the comparison of France, for example, which also has a colonialist past and perhaps a neo-colonialist present. Is there any difference in the structure of the economy between those two countries? It's that kind of question. In what is, of open what, yeah, whether or not it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it, what, what, form of capitalism, what form of economics, uh, um, it's that sort of question. Difference, uh, we have moved towards an open market economy uh -huh. versus um, closed and more socialist oriented. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. That's, that's well, I think that'll come up in discussion. Uh, you've just come in, so did you, any, any observations, economic observation? We'll try to be quick, go around the room. Differences, similarities? Yeah. Uh, well, in Russia, we have an economy with uh, predominant of state capital. I mean, uh, major companies, especially companies with the state capital. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I understand, in, in the UK, uh, there is a lot of private capital in the economy. Mm -hmm. And also in terms of uh, open market and entrepreneurship, it's also very different economy systems because um, the UK has strong um, protections of private capital. I mean, regulatory private mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because well, you can see, for example, from some companies, which is. Um, which are, you know, exists from 19th century or, you know, some small entrepreneurs uh, who, um, who make some, you know, business activity from past, from, and sometimes 200 years or 300 years from father to son, they just, so it's also some different differences. Yeah. I mean, there's not many very old companies now, but that you're right. There's this sort of, it's, it's, it's more or less a free market. But I'm going to go this, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this. This is kind of nasty because I've left you folks out. Do you have any, when I wrote Economy and Society, what did, what did you put down? If it's blank, it's blank. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Yeah, blank. Prioritization on, yes. Mostly, I mean, it's the first word that comes. Privatization, Privatization is the first yes. word. That's a good word to use. I mean, I'm not that into economic. Yeah. Economics, but, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to put it down to economics, but and uh, society, well, there are like stereotypes, politeness, um, very, um, like the politically correctness yeah. that is always there. So, um, 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 like people not getting really into saying what they really think, <laughs> um, but obviously it's a generalization. Um, yes, I mean, the correct answer. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of jumping ahead to society and economy, uh, soci the culture, isn't it? The, the, your very astute observations about reticence and whether or not people are showing what they really think and so on. So we'll come back to that. I'll just let's just talk about the economy and society a little bit because uh, it's it's relevant. Um, there's one thing I talked we talked about is a unitary nation state. You know about the flag? Everyone knows about the flag. It's a weird flag. It's 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 the, it, first of all, it, it, it's Britain is technically called the United Kingdom, and actually it's. It was disunited in some many profound ways, but the, the, the original kind of component elements of that sense of United Kingdom are a series of, if you like, acts of internal colonization of, by the English in Ireland, in Wales, 
Scotland, and, the, and uh, agreements, sometimes forced agreements, sometimes mutual agreements, to amalgamate power. And so the flag is just the layering of these old kingdoms, England and Scotland, become one kingdom after a century of conflict, and you get that flag, and then Ireland is incorporated. Wales, dear old Wales, has a, a really nice flag, which they don't, you can't incorporate. So they just leave it out. That's the one on the right? That's the, uh, the, uh, the dragon, the red okay. dragon. And that's the Welsh flag, which is kind of nice. I'd like to have a flag like that. It's kind yeah. of an interesting Maybe flag. Maybe can get in the center yeah. or something. Yeah. And the, the important thing is it, to remember is that countries are always changing. They're always churning. They're always evolving, developing, falling apart, coming back together again. And Britain, Great Britain is in the process of, it could be said, negatively or positively, it's reconstituting itself. It's, it's to a certain extent, it's, it's in the process of change. Is it falling apart? That's a, one way of thinking about it. Scotland, for example, for the last 15 to 20 years, has uh, very strongly, the po population of Scotland have claimed autonomy and been, get, been through parliament in London, there has been autonomy granted to the to Scotland, which has meant that there's a Scottish Parliament which passes its own laws, although that stops short of foreign policy and defense and fiscal policy, the sort of levers of the economy, but it has different policies on education, health, um, and there's the political party in Scotland would, uh, it's the Scottish Nationalist Party, lead Scotland to independence if it had uh, it tried to stage a referendum. You know what a referendum is, a vote to get Scotland independent. Most Scottish, by a, at that time, there was a, a vote and Scotland voted to remain part of the United Kingdom, but it could become independent. Ireland is immensely complicated because it's divided between Protestant and Catholic. And because of the Brexit issue, may, there may be uh, a Re, uh, recrudescence, a revival of conflicts between uh, different populations in Northern Ireland because of, at the moment, uh, it's, if you're living in Northern Ireland and you want to work in, in the Republic of Ireland, there's no problem. And many people in Northern Ireland, mostly but not exclusively Catholic, would like a united Ireland. So we're looking at a moving picture, just to go on. The thing about the economy, that's important is that Britain is the birthplace of capitalism in, in a very profound sense. It's a, it's a, a liberal capitalist country. It's liberal in the laissez-faire, open markets, freedom of choice, etc. all those words that we associate with it. However, and I'm sorry about this dense task, text, so it's the, it's the birthplace of capitalism. If you heard of Adam Smith, the, the Scottish writer who writes The Wealth of Nations, he's from these islands, and there are various other thinkers that are associated with capitalism who come from Britain. But there's also another part of the story, which is that in Britain you have very important institutions, such as the National Health Service and the BBC, which are not run along capitalist lines. They are we call, the, the word for this is their public corporations, which is not the same thing as a state-run organization. They're, the BBC, for example, has a arms it, uh, length management. It's independent of the government of the day, but it's, it's paid for out of a license fee, and it is autonomous, but it's not, it's not for, pro, uh, for profit. The National Health Service, much more directly controlled by the state, but is, an, as it were, is, is funded out of general taxation, uh, free at the point of use. And this is, it's, the National Health Service, I think, for understanding modern British society is probably more, in some ways, more important than understanding the monarchy, because it's one of the most popular institutions in British society. People feel it has lots of problems, like any health system, lots of problems, and you may, I hope you don't encounter problems with the National Health Service, but it's one of the things that British people 
of many different backgrounds are most proud of. It, it somehow it symbolizes modern Britain. It's this idea that it was something that was created after the Second World War. It was uh, this idea that somehow everyone has the right to free health care paid for out of general taxation. And if you compare it with the United States, for example, where health care is entirely private and it's very unequal so, and people can be uh, completely financially destroyed by having to pay for health care, it's a big difference. What about um, society what, and culture? Let's just try to, uh, did you write things down under differences of culture? Go around the room. And that, that, you know, that goes with this, this reticence. I'm from the U.S., it's so kind of close, but different. And we like to think of ourselves as a melting pot, but we're very divided still. And I know, maybe it's just London, but it seems a bit more actually incorporated here. Like Possibly very, more divided now? No, 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 sorry. Like more, yeah. it's more diverse in yeah. a better way. In the yeah. States, it's very... And you might say even more about the United States more divided now than it's been for some yes, time. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from people here, like when we talk, they have our, their own space. So if you should keep a, like a comfortable distance from people or they will feel very horrified, I think. <laughs> yeah, but in China, like if we were friends, we like to holding hands together and we're walking on the street or across our arms. Uh, it's kind of to show our in intimacy. Yes, but I think here, I still don't see people do this, like she, she holding hands together and walk, something like that. That's a really nice observation. It's a really important observation. Yeah. Does that apply to strangers as well? Like if you're standing in a line at the shop, like, do you think you might uh, be closer together? Um, <laughs> But, but it's compulsory, so <laughs> 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 you, don't need, you don't choose to do this, right? It's because of the situation. And in, on the tube, I think you'll find that people get very close together, <laughs> and pub, your personal space gets that whole concept of personal space gets thrown out, thrown out the window. What about um, like any differences of language, culture? Things people noticed on this side of the room? Well, what I noticed in terms of between, I'm from Guyana, South mm -hmm. America. My country, I feel it's openly multicultural, whereas mm -hmm. Britain, while it is multicultural, it is more below the surface, so you confirm. On the surface, you confirm, whereas where I'm from, it's quite open, it's quite okay to just sort of celebrate your, your differences mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't feel the same way here. I feel you need to look a particular way, speak a particular way. When I look around, I don't see <coughs> the diversity that I know is here. Mm -hmm. So it's as though it's when you go home, you can take off the cloak of what it means to be English. Yeah, I think Let's, let's see if that comes out in, in discussion, because it's really deep what you've said. It's controversial. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. Well. yeah. Um, I come from uh, Dubai. So Dubai is like a very multicultural city. Uh, but I guess I can relate to what she said. Like, um, from where I come, people are more like um, expressive in terms of uh, uh, like intimacy, emotional, they are much easier to approach socially, whereas I, um, I do realize that uh, like English people are, um, they have their own way of uh, expressing their uh, emotions or like um, relationships levels. Um, I guess it's also balanced from the perspective that people here are like more work focused, uh, whereas in some societies, like from my society, I know that people are more like socially focused 
So I guess it's kind of balanced here. So I see people working here for like from nine to maybe nine as well, uh, from nine to, to five or like seven. So most of their day is consumed in, in work and focus on work and they have to keep that up in order to sustain their lives. Whereas maybe in my country, it's, it's much relaxed in that sense. And that's why they have more um, like, let's say, freedom or like um, mentality uh, space to focus more on socially. I'm just trying to justify the difference here or yeah. like to look at why is such difference exists. There's an expression, working to live and living to, and living to work. And, and it's often said that people in Britain live to work yeah. rather than work to live, which is, you know, if you, that, you kind of change that focus. Nothing, pass, cultural differences. Some, yeah, sorry. Because uh, you just mentioned the, wor for the working times, or I actually found it, well, if compared to the Asian countries, we work from 8 till maybe 11 or, I mean, 11 in the night time or sometimes even midnight. So I actually found like people <laughs> do have more, <laughs> like, yeah, and then you can see people like um, having their lunch in the parks or like, you know, um, enjoying the sunshine. But, um, for example, in Taiwan, they would just have their lunch finished within 10 or 20 minutes in the office. So you don't see people like really relaxing. It's, I, I feel like in um, the workplace in Asia or Taiwan, Japan, the work uh, environment is more, I think it's more intense. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> and it's crazy. Intense. It's like, during, it's really work till midnight. During the 1980s, uh, when the, the, the first um, com big companies from uh, Asia started to come to Britain to build cars. At that point, the British automobile industry was not very, uh, had very bad industrial relations and bad cars had a bad reputation. They weren't sort of, manufacturing was faltering. And these new companies, uh, Toyota, Nissan, came over. And what was interesting is they brought trainers to these new factory sites. This is particularly in the case of Toyota, who were uh, almost like um, physical trainers who would do calisthenics with the groups of workers. And this was completely alien in British society, this idea that you have a kind of uh, group physical workforce that's kind of grouped around a, a work ethic. And yet other people think the British work way too ma many hours. And that in terms of, say, comparisons with other parts of Europe, Italy and France and so on, there's a huge debate about working hours in Britain being way off the scale, much longer than other countries by comparison, but actually quite low productivity by comparison. So you know, it's, it's this weird paradox. So I'm wondering if we can get it, in the time remaining, we can get it sort of the questions about um, what people do in public and what they do in private and, uh, and, and, and reticence and what they say and language. Um, while you were speaking, I was reminded of something, which is in the Mickey's section. You don't have to look at it now. It's this handout I gave you, which is about how to insult people. <laughs> yeah. And in that section, he gives these different words that you may encounter while you're here that are words that are used as insults. And the one that I love, that is kind of freaky, it's kind of weird, is the one that is quite. <laughs> quite, yeah. So, you know, you, you say something, quite, Q-U-I-T-E, is a word that has multiple meanings. Um, that's, qu that's a quite nice pair of shoes that you've got on. Um, uh, it's not a nice uh, uh, No. Um, oh, it's, that's quite nice. It, 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 you say, it's quite, quite, a, quite a nice day out, isn't it? It's Q, Q U I T E, yes? So you can say quite, you can say, I, I quite like that idea. That's, that's, a, that's a, a good idea. But then you can say, hmm, 
someone says something, mm, quite. And it can be completely different meaning. Yeah, yeah, but quite is even more. You can play with it. And then, and then, and then there are academic words that are even worse than that. That are even more. Um, so, nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless, or the worst one is, and if someone says this to you, you know that, that you're on their bad side. Is, is so, with the greatest respect, wow. which actually means completely the opposite. <laughs> So, and, and I think th that we're getting into this, well, that's why I said it was deep what you were saying, is getting into this sort of, it, you could say, an element of what is core about being Britain is, and I don't mean this, because I'm here and I live here, so I must like something about the place, is for it to be very hypocritical. So there's a kind of hypocrisy at the heart of British culture. Now, sometimes that hypocrisy is charming and kind of funny. Uh, and uh, but sometimes it's actually quite nasty mm -hmm. and the issue of just to go to where we we're talking about multiculturalism is probably one of those things that where hypocrisy can be quite nasty because Britain prides itself talk in terms of its public persona as a country which is deeply multicultural and 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 in some ways um, that myth that Britain likes to tell about it. it's a, a country that is of migration, it's a country where people have come from other places and live together, there's a sort of true it, truth to the myth. I don't mean myth as in a complete lie, I mean myth in the more cultural sense. So, for example, at, when my son was young at his school, where I live, there are children who come from uh, like a friend might come from, the mother is Turkish and the father is from uh, Trinidad. And the children in the school, when they meet each other, they, they ask, what's your mix? And that's the question, is what's your mix? And that's just a, that's a quite legitimate question. It's not an accu accusatory question, it's just a straightforward question kids ask in the playground. So there's that day-to-day -day sense that exists, but then there's another sense which is Yes, we're quite good at these sorts of things as a country. We manage to bring people together. And, and yet, in fact, there are real problems in the sense of there is uh, issues around the Brexit, whole Brexit debate, when you will listen to language that politicians use, and you'll find it reminiscent of debates in other, other parts of the world that are taking place now about there are too many of this people or too many of that people, and that, that sort of racism is actually coexists exactly alongside of this kind of mythic idea of Britain as a homogeneous multicultural society. Um, the strangest thing is the strange thing is um, I think we probably want, want to end soon but the one thing I want to kind of bring out to you is is anyone if you take a coin just anyone take a coin you've anyone got money in their pockets so you don't use money anymore yeah, if anyone wants to borrow a penny, they can, if you don't have any money. Okay, yeah, this is a penny. Does anyone need a... Uh, yeah, a pence, one pence, two pence. Anyone need... Just a... Okay. Okay. One pence, two, one penny, penny, pence. I think it's, you're not going to get into trouble by mixing up. I think it's, it's, it's one pen, one pence, one penny, two pence, I think it is. Yeah, you don't, you don't. Well, they're dying out here. Okay, so just this, this is an obvious thing to do, but it's a kind of weird thing, and I'm just going to kind of throw it out there for you as your our parting shot. So if you look at, you, you notice, it, British coins are quite pretty in many ways, and if you look at the one with the Queen's face on it, yeah? yeah. So it says the Queen's name, <laughs> Elizabeth II, and then it has D, G, Reg, F, D, 2014, or the date, yeah? Okay. Um, 
I don't have anything to give as a prize, but and I, I'm just, uh, anyone want to gauge uh, what that means? You have to be more precise than that. What, is the, what, is the, what do those initials mean? Well, I found it more like it's like D-E-I. It's D, D, G, Reg, F, D. Yeah, you're getting there, okay. Yeah. I'll do it for you, shall I? You give up, you're bored now? Okay. Deus gratia, this is all Latin. Deus, God, gratia, grace. So its translation would be by the grace of God. Reg is Regina, queen. It would be Rex if it was a king. And then the funny one is FD, which is Fide Defensor, Defender of the Faith. So the queen is by the grace of God, queen, defender of the faith. That's her title that comes out after every, and then you get Queen of England, Scotland, Ireland. It used to be Queen of England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, France. And there was always this thing, France, it used to be Calais. At any rate, what that coin shows you is the weirdest thing about Britain, which is that there's a state religion, uh, the Anglican Church, uh, which is um, uh, the monarch is the head of the church. And the um, bishops, you know what bishops are, the chief officials in the A Anglican Church, also sit in the House of Lords. And the monarch, it's a Protestant church, so it's not just a, any old church, it's an Anglican Protestant church. And it's shaped by the religious history of Britain, which is very, very complicated, but it involves the Protestant Reformation, big event, the, the defeat of Catholicism, the wars of religion, terrible wars of religion. Uh, it, not quite the Wars of the Roses, no, but Henry VIII's six wives. You know, he, he was married to the uh, daughter of the King and Queen of Spain, Catherine of Aragon, and he wanted to divorce her and went to the Pope. And the Pope said, no, you can't divorce her because you've already... I've already given you enough favors as it is, so he broke with Rome and made himself king, big King Henry VIII. And since then there's been an Anglican church. And this resulted in terrible persecution of Catholics in England. Uh, well, Mary Queen of Scots lost her head and all sorts of bad things happened. She's not Bloody Mary. No, she's Mary Tudor. So, so I'm, without doing too much British history in, in, at 4.30 in the afternoon to you, the important point is the, the monarch has to be a Protestant. And the monarch ca cannot marry a Catholic. It, by law, the monarch can marry a Muslim, a Jew, a Jedi Knight, a Hindu, but not a Catholic. And that's the result of history. It's very weird. And it's, it's still like in law? Yeah, and there's a, it, there's a, 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 a it's, it's, uh, it's an act of parliament that was passed 300 years ago, and there's a proposal to repeal it because it's crazy. It's a crazy, it's a crazy law. Um, and there are people who oppose the repeal because they want to keep England, because the, the argument for keeping the law in the statute books originally was to prevent the monarch becoming a Catholic, as happened in previous centuries. So this is very historical. You don't, in a sense, what this actually, what the paradox about this, because I was wanted to end on a discussion of religion, but I think we just, you know, we, we, can, we can just go away with this thought, is that Britain has a state religion, a national religion with the monarch as the head of state. It also has one of the lowest levels of church attendance of any country in the world. <laughs> It's crazy. It's a complete paradox. You know, you ha it's not like, say, for example, the United States. Take the United States as an example, which has no state religion, although there's elements of Christianity in the Constitution. Theoretically, there's a complete separation of church and state. It has one of the highest levels of church attendance in the world. Why? Is this rule um, applies for the, the whole royal family? Uh, no, it's the monarch. It's only for monarch. Yeah. Mm, just because I'll 
marriage of Meghan Markle and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, think she, I mean, she's not... Is she Catholic? She's I don't know. I'm not sure. I think she's Episcopalian, actually. She's a... The Episcopalian is the word for the Anglican Church in America. So I think she's an Episcopalian. Anyway, it's a kind of, it's an anic, it's a detail of history, that aspect of it. The, having the head of state as a, the church, uh, is the head of the church is strange, if you think about it. But what's equally strange or interesting is the fact that there's such low church attendance. So at any rate, I think at this point, I hope we've just had a, like a taste. I, it sounds to me as though you know quite a bit about being here and very observant. And one of the things I, sorry, we didn't get a chance to talk to was talk about food and yeah. music and, and so on. Um, um, but I think you'll look at Mikis and see what you think. And weather is another thing. And it's kind of a weird thing that British do people. If you want to strike up the, the best piece of advice someone ever gave me when I came here. So if you want to get into a conversation with someone, talk about the weather. Talk about the weather. <laughs> it's, it's the... It's the universal icebreaker. It, and, and the national dish is curry. The national dish is, uh, is, is yes, is um, chicken tikka masala, I think is, is the exact dish. Um, fish and chips is sort of second down. Oh. Tea, the milk always goes in first. Well, some people may disagree with that, the idea that the milk goes in first, but the milk goes in first. I, ha I hate, can't stand milk and tea, and the rest of the, most people in the world don't drink milk and tea, but the British insist on having milk and tea, and the milk always, some people say the milk, it's really a kind of one of these things you get to have people like beating each other up about milk in first, or milk after the tea goes in. And somehow it, that defines you. You know, whether or not you warm the cup and so on. Yeah, and, and how you hold the cup and all that thing. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you very much. Would I'm so we offense anyone if we prefer it either way? No, I don't think you would. It's okay. not a question of offense. It's a question of whether or not the person what says. That uh, is English. Uh, they even initialize it TBM, tea before milk, or MBT, milk before tea. <laughs> <laughs>